Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about um, VAPH uh, enabling the science and how we've been trying to improve VAPH uh, to help with that. Um, and when I was thinking about MUG, um, I thought, well, you know, there seems to be these like Alexa and, and Google Home apps for everything. And um, I, wonder, I wonder if there's one out there for, for MUG yet. <laughs> and um, yeah, sure, sure enough, I found one. Right. So you know the, the name's a little a little tacky, but whatever. So um, okay, Google, talk to Mug Buddy. All right, getting the test version of Mug Buddy. Welcome to Mug 2018. What can MPI do for you? Uh, can you hear that all right? Yeah. It's gonna process that. <laughs> Man, I have no clue. <laughs> so you know, I thought this was pretty good. It's got some some good information in it. You know, so the, the first thing I thought is, when is mug? I couldn't hear what you just said. Man, I have no clue. <laughs> when is mug? Mug 2018 will be held August 6th through August 8th at 1224 Kinnear Road in Columbus, Ohio. It is graciously hosted by the Ohio Supercomputing Center, the finest high-performance computing facility west of the mighty Olentangy. <laughs> we have two excellent keynote speakers. On Tuesday, Dr. Martin Schultz will give a talk titled, Just Writing a Standard is Not Enough. Then, on Wednesday, Dr. Amitabha Majumdar is presenting High Performance Computing and Big Data with RDMA-enabled high-speed interconnects, delivering science at SDSC for a decade. I hope you can catch them both. <laughs> yeah, so I thought that was interesting, but it's also got some natural language processing. I think it can read like the agenda. Anything else? <laughs> Where does Carl Schultz work? Everybody's going to get off the laptops. <laughs> okay, according to his mug bio, Dr. Carl Schultz earned his PhD from the University of Texas and worked one year as a postdoc. He works at CD Adapco. Okay, CD Adapco. No, wait, it says he returned to the University of Texas to work at TAC. Uh, oh, sorry, then it says he went to Intel in 2014, so he works at Intel now. No, no, I'm wrong again. Now it says he is an associate professor at the University of Texas. So Texas, Texas I think. Texas, are, are you sure it's Texas? He's either at Texas or he exceeded the word limit for his love bio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then last one I thought that's- Anything crazy. else? What does Bug stand for? <coughs> Sure, that's easy. MUG is an acronym, where the UG stands for user group. The letter M expands just a bit. Hang on a second. All right, I just inserted a slide into your talk to help explain. But, what? <laughs> I said, I just inserted a slide into your talk. Please go to the next slide. That's weird. How did you, uh... Oh, believe me, you don't really want to know how I did that. Okay, here we go. So it's an MPI library, with the source code based on mpitch and mvich. Now mpich stands for MPI on Chameleon, where MPI means message passing interface. And the V in mbich is short for the virtual interface architecture, but that part doesn't really matter, so let's keep going. The project page says that the name reflects the fact that the original implementation was an MPI implementation, over the InfiniBand VAPI interface, on the MPitch implementation. We're almost there. Are you still following me? No, not, not really. Great. Then I'll keep going. <laughs> now, InfiniBand VAPI is short for Melanox InfiniBand Verbs Application Programming Interface. And finally, now we know what the letter M in MUD stands for. Can you advance to the next slide? So instead of saying MUD 2018, we can say 
Message passing interface for Mellanox and Finnovan verbs application programming interface for Chameleon 2018. <laughs> I kind of like that better. That has a nice ring to it. Don't you think? Okay, so let me, let me get into the talk. I don't know who did that app. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, let me give just some quick background on, on Livermore. So uh, these, are, these are broadly the mission categories that the lab is charged with. Uh, biosecurity, counterterrorism, defense, energy, intelligence, non-proliferation, science, and weapons. Right? And um, really, to do all of this work, we have a whole lot of computing systems. Uh, here they're color-coded by different function at the lab, so we kind of break them down into capability, capacity, biz clusters, and, and serial workload. Right? That doesn't matter too much, but what I really want to highlight here is of those systems, if you color it differently, this is what we're running your package. Right? So the, the dark red is the default, so when you log into the system and you type in PICC, uh, when you log into the system and type in PICC, this is what you're getting. Right? And then the, the pink, or the light red, uh, these are the systems where Mvapage is available, but not, not necessarily in the form. Right? So we use Mvapage a lot. Uh, so let me detail some of the science people are doing with Mvapage. Right? So I'll start with Adam, um, just because I like the name. Uh, but this is accelerating therapeutics uh, for opportunities in medicine. Right? So this is a joint effort between Learn Somewhere Lab, the uh, Frederick National Lab uh, for Cancer Research, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and uh, UCSF. Right? Uh, this is the, the stated goal of this project is to reduce the time it takes from getting a drug candidate to getting it into clinical trials from the current time of six years down to 12 months. Right? And so when you think about that, that would just revolutionize medicine. Because if you can go from a drug candidate to getting a, a drug, that's available in clinical trials for under 12 months, now you have something that you can tailor to an individual patient or case-by-case -case basis. Uh, this is being built uh, using um, artificial intelligence based on a large data set provided by GlaxoSmithKline of uh, previous drug results. Right? And so the, the AI and actually HPC are both combined uh, to suggest new drugs or sort of tell you what a new drug compound will do uh, for one that it's never seen before. So Livermore's role in this uh, comes from the HPC side and also the machine learning side, right? So the, the machine learning side, what the function will be is to uh, supplement the data that's already provided by GlaxoSmithKline, right? You always want more data for your machine learning. And so you can run molecular dynamic simulations to simulate what these compounds will do for different, different uh, proteins. And that will build up the data set. And then the, the AI portion, the machine learning portion, is there to tell you the safety and efficacy of the drugs, how well they work. Right? All of this work from the Livermore side will be running on systems that are, that are running Vantage. Um, let me jump into climate modeling. So Livermore has a long, successful hi uh, history in the climate modeling community. Um, just this past April, uh, a new source code was released uh, that was four years under development. So this is a massive project. There were, you know, 100 people or more working on this project for four years, uh, scattered among different DOE labs uh, and also universities. And the point of this code is to model uh, how the air and water temperatures change over daily, yearly, and going out for decades. Right? And that it's global climate, but it also models weather at a local level. Right? And so if you look at the figures on the right here, the top right figure is showing ocean temperatures. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, cooling that's, that's happened because a hurricane has blown through and sort of sucked the energy out of the ocean temperature in this case. On the bottom figure, it's showing ocean currents, so the flow and the, and the speed of the currents. Uh, and you can see from this that it's very fine scale, right? So the code is down a nominal 15 kilometer uh, resolution, <coughs> although you can zoom in further into the one kilometer area, right? And the, the point of this, as I said, is to, to measure or, or estimate the, chimp, the temperature differences uh, in air and water. And the point of that is that you can then estimate the power demand, future power demand for different climates 
right? So if you know how the temperature is going to change on a daily basis and then can model that forward for decades, you can figure out how much heating and cooling is going to be needed by the homes and businesses, right? It's also needed for water use to, to figure out how much, uh, how to basically manage the water systems. Again, all of the work in developing this and testing it and getting it to this point, a lot of it has been done on our systems running MapH. Going forward, running the models to actually produce results, testing and maintaining the code, again, will be done within MapH. Right, and then here I'm going to try to play a video. So this is a, a recent earthquake uh, simulation. <coughs> uh, let me see if this video just goes here. For internet connections, no good. We'll skip out. Need another Google Home uh, joke to uh, fill the void here. <laughs> Well, and the answer is time. Maybe I'll skip this. So um, there's, a, there's a link that I have in the slides. You can go watch this. Uh, what I wanted to show is that this has a earthquake simulation. In Researchers the at Lawrence Livermore are working on better understanding the effects of earthquakes, which includes simulating what might happen during one. This simulation shows a magnitude 7.0 earthquake on the Hayward Fault, and the area shown in this animation covers most of the populated San Francisco Bay Area. This is the highest resolution earthquake simulation ever done for Northern California that takes into account three-dimensional geological structure and topography. To achieve this level of detail, the simulation was done on one of the lab's supercomputers, where the calculation ran on over 86,000 processors for 18 hours. Let's take a look at what happens. The earthquake starts at the northern end of the fault. A 50 kilometer section of the fault ruptures, shown as the black line. The intensity of ground shaking is shown according to the color scale on the right, where red indicates the strongest shaking of up to one meter per second, shaking that can damage buildings. The blue color indicates shaking that could be felt but not cause damage. The earthquake only takes about 20 seconds to rupture, but the seismic waves traveling away from the fault shake the entire Bay Area for over 90 seconds. The intensity of ground shaking varies from area to area according to the pattern of slip on the fault itself and the geologic structure of the ground. For example, low seismic wave speeds of softer sedimentary rocks amplify shaking compared to harder rocks. That means that sedimentary basins like the San Pablo Bay, San Leandro Basin, Santa Clara Valley, Dublin Pleasanton Livermore Valley, and the Delta experience longer durations of shaking because their geologic structure can trap seismic waves. Simulating ground motions during and after an earthquake, like in this animation, can help us evaluate seismic hazards and calculate potential damage to buildings. The particular scenario represented in this simulation is just one possible rupture of the Hayward Fault. Future simulations will explore other possibilities and will continue to help us prepare for earthquakes and their consequences. Yeah, so just really quickly to summarize this, this was the first simulation that was able to um, model uh, shaking frequencies of four to five hertz, right, at this scale. And so the reason that's important is that's the range where you need to get to to estimate the damage done to buildings in a big earthquake, right? Uh, this was just recently done on quartz, again running with advantage. Right, there's, there's plenty more. I'm gonna speed through these pretty quick. Uh, recent work, uh, concussions. So people have found that there, people are suffering uh, brain injury even without being diagnosed of a concussion. Basically, even any small hit to the brain uh, can still do damage, even if the doctor doesn't think you, you suffered a full-blown concussion. That's new, that's done on InvatPitch. Uh, this just started back up. So the, the uh, UN Intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. So this is a seven year report. Uh, one was done in 2007, another in 2013, and they're just starting a new one. Um, this report basically is available to all the governments uh, within the UN, and they use this to then set legislation policy, policy on climate change, right? So this has major impact, not only on the US, but the entire world. Um, again, done with 
and Vapich. And I'm pulling this one from last year, but um, you know, I just think it's so cool. Uh, so this is a project with NASA where, um, in the eventual future, if they detect some asteroid that could be on a collision course with Earth, uh, and if you detect, detect it far enough in advance, you might be able to deflect it off course, right? If you go just impact it with something. And so they're actually planning to run an experiment in 2020 where they launch a satellite out and, and go smash it into another asteroid and measure, measure the effect of that. And before they're doing all that, they're doing a bunch of simulation work to sort of figure out, based on the composition of the asteroid, what will the impact be, uh, the effect of the impact. Uh, again, this is done with advantage. Um, so the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that there's a lot of science uh, being done with Mvapich at Livermore, um, but these are big scientific questions too, right? So they're, they're answering big questions that matter a lot that literally change the world. The governments look at these reports and they make decisions based on this. Um, and to me, uh, for the people working on that, that's just incredible, right? To, to think like while you're in grad school or a postdoc, you're working on this project it has such an impact on the entire world, right? This is just a sliver of what Livermore does. Um, you, you saw in Dr. Panda's talk earlier how many other institutions are using Mbappage, so just multiply that out. Right? It's really incredible. Uh, for the, the next segment of the talk, I just want to dive into, uh, so actually let me step back. And putting this together uh, each year, it's a lot of fun for me. It's actually a lot of work because I, I have to do a fair amount of research because I'm talking about a bunch of stuff that I don't understand. But um, it's fun because I, I can see what science people are doing, right? And usually I don't, I don't know. I'm just installing MPI all day. <laughs> but the second thing is I, I usually have to talk to some of the scientists to get some of the background. And so in these cases, I've talked to two. Um, and these are, these are two subjects here uh, involving drones and artificial intelligence. So if you find this part boring, it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, so this is collaborative autonomy. Uh, the idea here is you have uh, a person uh, in combination with a fleet of uh, autonomous machines, right? And they're trying to achieve some joint goal. So unlike a person flying a drone, where the drone is under the, every command is, is given by the human, these machines are, are largely autonomous. So they have sensors and they can sort of navigate through their own environment on their own. And they, they talk to each other so they can coordinate on sort of scanning the, the environment. Uh, and they can detect things, whatever the target happens to be, and then forward that back to the human operator who can make some decision based on that. Right? So this, this I pulled from um, the Science and Technology <laughs> Review magazine that Livermore puts out once a month. I've got a link down here to it. But in this article, they, they give two use cases. One is where you mount these ground penetrating radar devices on these drones, and then you can have a fleet of them flying in front of a vehicle looking for any kind of like landmine or something, right? And then if it detects it, it basically sends it back to the vehicle so the operator knows where it is and disable it. Uh, the second example they give, which I thought was really interesting, was imagine the case where a firefighter in, enters a building Right? And you have hallways and rooms off the hallways and stairwells, right? And you don't know where the people are, right? Well, the, the firefighter could basically have a, a fleet of drones that just fly down through the hallways and into the rooms and up the stairwells, locating people and then sending the information back, right? Or it could tell him, don't go down that hallway because it's, it's been blocked by a beam that's fallen over. Right? So really cool stuff. Um, MPI is being used in this effort not on the drones themselves, but to sort of model the communication among the drones, right? So if you look in the top right figure, you can see each of those light gray areas are sort of the, the area that an individual drone can see, and the red marks are, are the targets that it's detecting. The drones coordinate. So they, they first of all coordinate to make sure they're covering all the space, but they also coordinate to sort of cross-validate each other's detections to be sure that you've got a real detection and not some false positive. There's messages being passed between the drones to make that happen, right? But you're also dealing with messages that are high latency, low bandwidth, and lossy, right? Packets are being lost. And so the, the properties of the radio systems on these drones determine how fast you can converge to an answer on whether there's a detection there or not. Uh, and so that's what they're using MPI for. They're simulating these networks and changing the properties, you know, changing the latency and the bandwidth and the packet loss, and then running the different consistence algorithms over top 
to figure out how fast you can converge because the rate at which you can converge determines the rate at which you can scan the environment, right? You can't push these things forward until they've made a decision on the area they're already covering. Uh, the, I talked to the user um, running this, or the, the researcher actually doing all this work. I should say researcher instead of user. This is my support role. Um, and so uh, I, asked, I asked him, you know, what's, what, if you could change one thing in MPI, what would it be? And he immediately came back and said, uh, the thing that really gets in my way all the time is I would, I would like to have an all-reduce where I can combine, you know, a custom all-reduce because I really need to do a sum and a min at the same time. And I did that, and it ran way slower than if I just did a sum followed by a min. Um, and I've heard that complaint multiple times, so, um, you know, that's one thing that's out there. Uh, another, a couple other things he did mention was, um, it sounds like in their case they can make use of non-blocking or reduce, but I'm not sure he even was aware of it. Um, they would like to overdo, decompose the problem so they can run more processes uh, on the node than they have cores, right? And so in order to do that, again, you need some good non-blocking progress. Uh, and this user uh, mentioned that he really missed the C++ bindings. He was really bummed that those were taken out of the standard. And I tried to explain to him why they were taken out of the standard. I didn't mention to him that I served on the forum and voted that they should be removed. <laughs> but it was interesting to hear that, right? That's another perspective. Um, okay, so the other area, HPC for deep learning. Um, at Livermore, there's a development going on uh, called LBAN, which is um, basically a deep learning toolkit to train deep neural networks. It's built from the ground up to run on HPC uh, systems. So it's built to make use of MPI, low latency, high bandwidth, uh, collective operations, right? It's also built to scale. So uh, it, can, it can go parallel in multiple ways. Like most frameworks, it can go in data parallel mode. It also has model parallelism where you can split the parameters of the model across nodes. Um, and it can even run multiple models sort of simultaneously and then average things together in, in a clever way. Um, won't we'll go into a whole lot of detail other than to point out that the new version of LBAN is now this layered stack. Um, this has changed from, from the last year when I presented a similar, similar slide. Um, it's now layered on Hydrogen, which is their distributed linear algebra library, um, and then Aluminum, which is a custom-built communication library that they've put together. Um, you know, I guess for this audience, the, the most interesting thing is from the aluminum side, they, they started hand coding their own collective operations because they weren't getting the performance out of the system software that they wanted. Um, so these guys make uh, very effective use of threads and GPUs, and they're very good at sort of launching non-blocking operations. Um, there's a number of bullets I've got on the left side. These are all requests coming from this team. Um, in fact, I would highly recommend maybe they get invited next year because I think they could fill a whole talk. Um, but I, I covered most of those bullets at the top last year, so I'm not going to cover those. But the new stuff are the three at the bottom dealing with um, GPUs. So they're starting to use multiple threads. So they run MPI and thread multiple mode. They use GPUs. Some of the threads have GPU contacts and some don't. And they've run into this issue where it's just speculation right now, but they think that there'll be an outstanding communication that's posted from a GPU buffer that's sitting in the progress engine. And then another thread comes along that doesn't have the GPU context, calls some other unrelated MPI call, and then kicks the progress engine. Right? And then it tries to progress that GPU communication, which then goes bad. And so they've seen a couple of cases like that. Um, I don't know the best way to, to really solve that. It seems like maybe within MPI, if you can track uh, GPU contacts and associate within the, the communication, um, then filter that on the, on the communication list when you progress them or something. But, um, the other thing that they mentioned was they, they are running a lot of these kernels on the GPU, and they want to keep, they keep the data down there, they're very good at doing that, they, they sequence the kernels together, but <coughs> they want to transfer the data from GPU to another, and they would like to be able to basically do an ISIN and a wait on the GPU. Right? And so that sounded to me a lot like the GPU direct async idea. Um, and so I was curious where, where things stand on that. But um, we, can, we can keep going and take it in the discussion later, I guess. Uh, let's see. 
Okay, so the, the other last segment here I, I want to get to uh, is the work um, that we've been doing in the past year or so to try to improve in VAPH for our science apps. Right, so in January, we, um, as Dr. Panda mentioned, we, we signed a contract with Fscale Solutions to do this work, um, and we've been keeping them pretty busy. So uh, we've, over that time, we created uh, 28 tickets over about seven months, which was running about one ticket per week to do different things. Um, the sort of the big level breakdown is on the right. So uh, the, the first thing that we wanted the team to do was make sure that Mvapich runs and runs well on all of our systems. So we have a large variety of systems, hardware, processors, networks, and we wanted the software to, to work everywhere and also work well everywhere. Um, the second thing we wanted was, uh, we wanted the, the distributions that only come in RPMs so that those could run on all of our systems, right? So namely in Vapage 2X and in Vapage 2 GDR. Uh, and so the team went out and uh, they, they basically maintain these builds for us they have to turn those over every so often when we update the system software or add a new compiler and that kind of thing. So it's, it generates some work, but I think most of the build effort is probably settled down and, and we'll focus more on bugs and performance from here on out. Uh, and then yeah, a handful of bugs and performance features have come in. Uh, the, the other thing we've asked them to do is add small configuration options for us, right? So we're a big Slurm shop, for example. Um, we use Slurm to set the CPU binding on the processors, or processes. And, and Batpitch also tries to do that, but sometimes they fight with each other, right? And so we wanted to turn that off, and we needed a configuration option to do that. So there are a bunch of little things like that that just make managing it at, at our site a little easier. Um, then we started contributing some stuff back. So um, we have a benchmark called MPI Bench. This measures collective performance. And then it, it does two things with that. Um, one is that it's got this post-processing script uh, that has sort of these checks or assertions in it, right? And these are, you can think of them as like relative performance checks, right? For example, um, it, it basically, for every collective uh, measurement you do, it records the collective operation you did and the number of nodes and processes you're using and the message size. Right? And then it can use that and, and do cross compares to other, other functions. So one of the things you would like is your MPI all reduce should be faster or at least no slower than doing an MPI reduce followed by an MPI bcast. Right? And if you find that's not the case, really you would like to throw a flag and alert the MPI implementers that you know, maybe you've tuned your collectives off just a little bit. So there's a handful of checks like that in there. Um, it also checks across like node sizes and message counts, right? So like a, a small message all reduce shouldn't be a lot faster than a, sl a larger message all reduce, right? Common sense kind of stuff like that. Um, and so this now is in the regression test. So when Mvapage makes a release, it goes through these, these kind of checks. Um, the other thing that it can do is it will, given two data sets from two different measurements, it can compare them in a speed up fashion. Right, and it does this and, and generates a little HTML table that colors the cells based on the speed up. So you can sort of immediately see where things have gotten faster or slower. Um, so the, all the green boxes are things where, that have been sped up. In this case, I did a quick test on MPI all to all on a single node from Mvapage 2.2 to Mvapage 2.3. And you can see that the team made some good improvement in this case, especially as you scale up the number of processes on the node. Uh, there is like the purple column on the left, which is some uh, weird, I guess that's just a single process all to all, but um, seems to have slowed down. I, I only ran this test once, so don't necessarily trust the data, but this is the kind of thing you can see, right? And so you can also run this against each collective from one release to the next to sort of verify that you haven't stepped down in performance uh, during the release. This particular test case was done actually in response to one of our applications. So uh, our apps found that they, when they ran with Mvapich, they were running much slower than when they ran with Intel MPI. And so uh, they dug into that, the app team, and figured out that um, the cost was all coming from an all to all, and it was an on-node all to all. So they, they do these FFTs and they keep them on the node, um, and all the cost difference seemed to be coming from there. So we asked um, through the 
support contract we have to, for the team, for the Mbappage team to go look at that and, and try to fix it. And this is some of the improvement that they've done from 2.2 to 2.3. Um, can you guys the, the weird thing is the case that seems to be performing worse is a single process uh, MBA job. Yep. So it's like a send self. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, and I would I would run this test over again to be sure that that's a legitimate number. But um, yeah, you can see things like that. Yeah, uh, I take a look. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> right, one other thing that we've contributed back. Um, so again, this was motivated by one of our application team, uh, namely uh, deep learning apps, right? That are doing large all reduces. Um, and so if you looked at the all, the large message all reduce within Mbappage, it was using a ring based. Um, algorithm, which is the right algorithm that you want to select, uh, but it was it was based on MPI rank, right? So it wasn't really paying attention to where those ranks were. And as long as you're running sort of in block distribution mode, your ring lays out really nicely on your nodes, so that most of the data is being transferred through shared memory, which is good. They're only sending data through the network once, right? But if depending on the process distribution, you can end up in a in a bad state, right? So in the case of cyclic, it, it's sort of the worst case. In this case, every, every data element is being sent across the network every time <laughs> for every process, right? It's just ping-ponging back between the nodes. Um, and so that's bad. So uh, I was working on this along with um, Daniel Sikic, who actually did most of the development. Um, and all we did is we, we basically gather up the list of ranks and remember which node they're on, right? So that you can, you can lay out the ring appropriately based on that. And so uh, this applies not only to all reduce, but all gather and reduce scatter. Um, this now is in Mbappage 2.3. Um, and in our testing, we were seeing speed ups around 3x or so for that. Uh, again, that, that was mainly in response for one of our application teams. Right, okay, so then let me, let me come to the end of the talk. So I guess one other point that I, I want to bring up is, maybe, maybe it's a gripe, I don't know, it's, but how do you pronounce Mbappage, right? Um, I think it's interesting because, I, especially as a, as a support person in Livermore Computing, I hear people say it a whole lot of different ways. <laughs> uh, so of course there's like Mbappage, right? Which is the way I tend to say it. There's Mbappage. Some people just see a, a, a mix of letters there and just give up and try to, try to spell it out, <laughs> right? Letter by letter, M-V-A-P-I-C-H, right? So this is, um, such an issue that it, it's like answer number two on the Mbappage fact <laughs> is, <laughs> is how, to, how to pronounce the name of the thing. Um, I, I kind of think it's fun because to me it's, it's sort of like one of those like pick your own adventure books that you read when you're a kid, but in word form. <laughs> There's probably like five or six different ways to say it. Um, it also reminds me of like this map. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is back from 2012. They pulled this from Huffington Post. It was research actually done by some people at a university. Um, and this was like the way people would say soda or pop, right? So growing up in the Midwest, I called it pop. And when I moved to California, people gave me strange looks, so now I call it soda. Um, and you can see this map. And in the South, they just call it Coke, like everything's Coke, right? <laughs> What kind of Coke do you want? Pepsi. <laughs> and so, and so it, you know, I think in Vapage is sort of kind of the same way. Like you have these different cultures that call it different names in different areas. But, so in Ohio, it's probably called the right name. <laughs> so the, you know, the fact wasn't put together by the time I took the job at Livermore, so I was pronouncing it the wrong way. So you know, like all that yellow on the West Coast is probably me you know, giving the wrong name. It's like basically the same map. And I think in the South, those are, those are the poor, poor souls that just spell it out all the time. <laughs> Which is a little disappointing because Texas is, is included, so I think TAC is in there. So that's, that's too bad. But um, <laughs> T-A-C-C is in there. <laughs> yeah, T-A-C-C. E everything is Coke unless it's Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think that maybe there's a use for that where um, you've got all these different flavors of Mbappage, and maybe you could just distinguish them by calling them, you know, with different pronunciations. Um, I also found that the Google app that somebody put together has an opinion. So, okay, Google, talk to Mud Buddy. All right, getting 
the test version of Mug Buddy. Welcome to Mug 2018. What can MPI do for you? How do you pronounce the name of the software? The name is pronounced M V A P I C H. No, no, no. You can you can say it as one word. Okay, got it. M V A I. No, it's listen. <laughs> M vat bitch. M V pitch. No, no. M vat bitch. M vat pitch. That's right, you got it. M vat bitch. M vat pitch. One more time faster. M vat pitch. That's perfect. And now what's your favorite MPI? Open MPI. <laughs> ha ha ha, I got you. Oh man, you should have seen the look on your face. I'm just messing with you. So that's this, on my last slide here. Um, so in March, uh, the Secretary of Energy came to visit Livermore, um, and of course he met with all the high ups. Um, I wasn't one of them. I uh, met with the director, and he toured all over the lab, like all the coolest facilities of the lab. And uh, one of the places he came was the computer center. So here he's walking around on the computer center floor. And he, he showed him all the work that's going on. Right? And basically this gets back to the, to the main point of the whole talk here. Um, you know, Rick Perry's quote here is, what you're doing in a lot of different areas has the potential to change the world. The computational capacity, what you have the potential to do, is nothing less than the world changing. This lab is going to be part of the story. It may not be 10 years from now, it may be sooner than that, of how people's lives really get affected in a positive way. Right? So it's more than just me saying this. It's important people who make decisions. Um, but you and I both know that that's not the whole story. Right? And also, you know, if you've seen a mug talk before that I've given, um, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you, Mvapich, uh, for all you, all you do, all the science that you enable, and for continuing to improve the product over all these years. Uh, we look forward to using it for a long time. Again, you know, thank you, Mvapich, or if you prefer the longer name, you know, thank you, message passing interface for Melodox and Fenabang Verbs application programming interface for Camille. All right. Thanks, guys.